Thank you. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Uh, Klaus says that his acquaintance with me stems 10 years, 12 years. Mine with him stems back even much longer than that. Klaus's work on aggression was, was some, of the, the, some of those papers are what really stoked my initial interest in this area. And so it's a, it's a really nice kind of full circle to have the opportunity to come here. And moreover, what a remarkable thing that there is an entire lecture series devoted to this most important and, as Dean Cook said, most timely topic, the intersection of self-control and antisocial behavior and aggression is something we see before us every day, and yet we know so very little about its neurobiological origins. And so that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a stab at unpacking today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the, the neurobiology of self-control failure. And I'll start with a deceptively simple question. And that is, what's wrong with my life? <laughs> Excellent. And that is, what's stopping you, right? What's stopping you from eating this second piece of delicious cake, right? What's stopping you? All right, not all of you are cake lovers, that's fine. Uh, what's stopping you from ducking outside after my talk and doing a line of cocaine, or for that matter, ducking outside right now and, and doing a line or a bump? Ah, what's stopping you from cheating on your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or your husband, or your wife with an attractive stranger that you meet at a bar or party this weekend, right? What's stopping you? What's stopping uh, you and you and you, and especially you, sir, and me? from doing everything that deep down in the darkest parts of our greedy little selves we truly want to do, right? Cake is delicious. That's just, that's a scientific fact. You can take it from me, it's, it's great. Cocaine feels amazing probably. I, I read things on the internet to suggest that, that that's true. Uh, extramarital sex I, I can't speak to personally, but the volume of Craigslist uh, casual encounters ads speaks to this particular extracurricular activity being uh, very popular, right? And, and in a way, the, the, the question of self-control can be framed by considering these three C's, cake and cocaine and cheating, and, and all of these things feel great. So why are we here right now and not out there doing all of these fun things, right? The, the question of self-control is really about what is stopping us from doing all of these incredibly intrinsically rewarding things that we could do, but we don't, out of some sense, perhaps, that they might be potentially costly in the future. But whatever this thing is, whether we call it self-control or impulse control or executive function or, or inhibitory control or what have you, there are lots of different names for it, but whatever specific label we put on it, it's just plain as day that some people don't have it. Highly impulsive people, people who we can say lack self-control, consistently make very rash, very destructive decisions that put their health and their lives and their safety and our health and our lives and our safety in great jeopardy. And these folks are at a much greater risk for a range of psychological disorders especially drug addiction and antisocial personality disorder. And though they're a relative minority in the population at large, this small group of self-control failing people are responsible for an absolutely astronomical uh, amount of, of, of fiduciary damage, right? These folks are responsible for, for almost, uh, for literally trillions of dollars every single year that leaves our economy due to direct costs like treatment and incarceration, and also indirect costs like uh, opportunity costs and lost productivity. And so the work in my lab is focused on figuring out how we get these people exactly. And to do that, we use uh, brain imaging and brain stimulation to identify specific brain circuit mechanisms that underlie a range of self-control-related cognitive functions. And we're especially interested in clarifying how variability in the function of these, of these brain circuits leads to individual differences in self-control-related symptoms. Now, psychological models of self-control have traditionally been of the hydraulic sort, right? The, the prevailing conceptualization of self-control in most of psychology is that of an effortful, capacity-limited resource that's used to inhibit 
prepotent, maladaptive responses. And the dominant viewpoint is that self-control impairments in antisocial folks or in drug addicts arises from a deficit in the capacity to actively inhibit the execution of automatic responses to reward stimuli or threat stimuli. And over and over and over again, you see the, the metaphor of breaks being used to describe the pathophysiology of both drug addiction and antisocial aggression. And it's often framed in the context of a dual systems model, right? You have the gas pedal, which depending on the particular author, is either the amygdala or the, the ventral striatum, which motivates automatic but selfish or destructive or maladaptive responses. And then you have our savior, this break, instantiated as prefrontal cortex, which actively, effortfully inhibits these, these behaviors. And the idea is that the, the, the self-control deficits, the poor self-control that you see in drug addicts and antisocial offenders <laughs> comes from a diminished prefrontal top-down inhibition. In other words, a braking failure. So within this model, it's, it's taken as a given that every time you see prefrontal cortex come up in a brain imaging study or a brain stimulation study of drug addiction or antisocial behavior, that it's acting as a brake. So when you see findings that show uh, deficient prefrontal engagement or, or lower prefrontal cortical thickness in people with disorders of self-control, it's often assumed that these are just neurobiological reflections of what we already know is this broken prefrontal break. And yes, it's true. Substance abusers and antisocial offenders, they, they do show these pretty dramatic deficits in executive function, and they show clear evidence of, of uh, uh, structural and functional alterations in these portions of prefrontal cortex that others have shown uh, is important for inhibiting prepotent responses. But when you actually look at the anatomy, the, the, the actual circuits that are involved here, uh, the first thing that becomes immediately obvious is that the, the, the brain circuitry at issue isn't wired in such a way that could even accommodate this kind of break. This circuit is centered on the striatum, uh, which, which uh, many other people, uh, including Klaus, have shown is really important for representing the value of stimuli and actions and, and generally in motivating all kinds of, of uh, evolutionarily salient behaviors. And the striatum receives ascending or bottom-up afferents from the dopaminergic midbrain. And these midbrain inputs convey information about the learned reward value of stimuli. Exposure to stimuli with high learned reward value causes these midbrain neurons to enter a burst firing mode, which leads to a brief high amplitude pulse of dopamine in the striatum. And this phasic dopamine signal is really important for biasing action selection. So this, this is a mechanism that is really important for determining the actions that are actually selected. We as organisms have this capacity to profit from our experience, to learn over repeated uh, exposure to a stimulus, its reward value, and then when we're exposed to it again, that information is conveyed to the striatum in a way that can bias the selection of an action that uh, results in the consumption of an item with high learned reward value. But in addition to these ascending or bottom-up uh, midbrain inputs, the striatum also receives descending glutamatergic projections arising in the prefrontal cortex, the lateral and medial aspects, right? Uh, and these prefrontal inputs stimulate the release of sustained low amplitude tonic dopamine release. Uh, at, at, so this is, it's, it's, it's a complicated circuit, but it's so amazingly cool, right? It's this incredible homeostatic self-regulating system, right? So you have these, this information from the midbrain that, that tell an organism to you know, choose an action that is gonna uh, give it access to a, a, preferred or, or, or a, a preferred stimulus or a stimulus with lots of reward value, right? And, and, and the firing of these midbrain dopamine neurons causes the release of dopamine in the striatum here. But we also have these descending glutamatergic and they bind on these presynaptic terminal autoreceptors here. 
right? Or rather, they bind to glutamate receptors in the, the presynaptic terminal, and that causes the release of, of low amplitude dopamine that then feeds back on these presynaptic terminal autoreceptors, which blocks the release of dopamine even after a signal from the midbrain. So in a sense, what the prefrontal cortex is able to do is use information about uh, costs and consequences and rules and goals to effectively override the, the signal that's coming up from the midbrain here. So it doesn't matter the amplitude of the signal that's being sent to the striatum from the midbrain, prefrontal cortex, by virtue of these descending glutamatergic afferents that act on these presynaptic uh, terminal autoreceptors, is able to limit how much dopamine is actually released following a pulse from these midbrain ascending uh, 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 neurons, right? And so, so we have these prefrontally regulated uh, tonic dopamine release that acts on inhibitory presynaptic terminal autoreceptors to dampen phasic dopamine release. So you have this push-pull system here. And so why am I telling you this? Why is this circuit anatomy important? Why am I walking into a psychology department and going into exquisite maddening detail about these neurobiological circuits? I'm telling you all this because this anatomical arrangement implies something very different about what prefrontal cortex is actually doing to regulate our behavior and bias our behavior towards more adaptive ends. Right? What it suggests is that prefrontal cortex can bias choice behavior by modulating the ability of reward-associated cues to drive action selection via phasic dopamine signaling. Prefrontal cortex, we know, is really important for representing goals. It engages in these perspective simulations and computes action outcome predictions. And this anatomical arrangement that I've discussed allows these prefrontal representations to affect choice behavior by dynamically shaping the subjective value of action options by very, very precisely modulating the amount of dopamine that's released in response to a stimulus in the environment. And so, in our model, prefrontal cortex optimizes decision making by adaptively reweighting striatal action value signals rather than by inhibiting the execution of an action program after valuation and selection have already occurred. And our hypothesis is that the impulsive behavior of, of drug addicts and criminal offenders happens when this top-down afferent modulation is weaker than the bottom-up drive from the midbrain, leading to a stimulus-driven phasic dopamine release and action selection that, that is unconstrained by information about long-term goals and costs and consequence. And I'll now show a series of studies in which we test this model by examining circuit function in impulsive and antisocial populations and by directly manipulating this circuit and reading out the impact on circuit connectivity and impulsive choice behavior. So the first hint that maybe we were on the right track uh, by looking at value and motivation uh, as, as a potential uh, pathomechanism for antisocial behavior came from a combined dopamine PET imaging and fMRI study in a sample of community volunteers. Uh, in that work with David Zald at Vanderbilt, we used a self-report questionnaire called the Psychopathic Personality Inventory, or PPI. And we use this because we know that it predicts many of the kinds of low self-control behaviors that are most interesting to us. Uh, the, the PPI breaks out into two more or less orthogonal factors, one of which, which I won't talk about further, this factor one, uh, tracks anxiety and social dominance. But this factor two, this impulsive antisocial factor, has incredibly robust associations to manifestly antisocial behavior, to drug problems, to reactive aggression. And so we used this scale as a way of trying to uncover some of the, the neurobiological circuit correlates of, of impulsive aggression and low self-control. In the, the PET imaging component of the study, uh, basically, PET imaging is a technique that allows you to visualize changes in uh, the, the, the density of particular receptors all throughout the brain. And we used a, a modification of this technique that involved the administration of a psychostimulant called amphetamine. Then this allowed us to visualize all across the brain in, in each of our subjects the amount of dopamine that was released anywhere in the brain after we gave our subjects this stimulant, amphetamine. So what we're doing here is giving a drug, amphetamine, it's causing dopamine to be released, we're using PET imaging to visualize how much dopamine is being released and where. And we're correlating that with this measure of impulsive antisocial behavior. 
And when we did that, what we found is that the most impulsive antisocial individuals, well, those were the people who released the most dopamine in the ventral striatum after we gave them amphetamine. So the more impulsively antisocial a person was, the greater uh, the, the magnitude of dopamine release in this region, the, the nucleus accumbens that resides in the ventral striatum. And this suggested to us that, that these folks might have some kind of motivation-related bias, uh, perhaps an enhanced assignment of, of reward value to environmental cues uh, in a way that biased action selection. But truthfully, this is terrible data for making that inference because dopamine is released in response to a lot of things. Dopamine is released in response to stress. It's released in response to pain. Sometimes frustrative non-reward releases dopamine. Other people have shown that dopamine is, is, tracks not necessarily the reward value, but the salience of a, of a particular stimulus. So this data alone is, is a poor foundation for making the kind of inference that we wanted to make. So we brought our participants back and put them in a different scanner, an, a functional MRI scanner, and had them perform this task, the monetary incentive delay task. And this lets us look directly at reward motivation related activity in the ventral striatum. So very briefly in this task, participants are told that they can win or avoid losing money by pressing a button very quickly. They're told the amount of money that they can win or that they can avoid losing. There's this delay period during which they don't do anything. They sort of prepare their motor response. Uh, a target, a white square, appears on the screen for very briefly and they have to press the button. And then they get some feedback about whether or not they won or avoided losing the money that was at stake for that trial. And other work by Brian Knudsen has shown that we can parse this trial into an anticipation phase and a receipt phase. And the anticipation phase in particular uh, is known to, to robustly engage this, this aspect of ventral striatal circuitry that I've shown is, is potentially important for impulsive antisocial people. And we found that in analog to the PET data, the less self-control you have, the greater your ventral striatum responds when you have the opportunity to select instrumentally rewarded actions. So this study showed that in this community sample, of impulsive antisocial people, the, the, the more impulsively antisocial you were, the more dopamine you released in the ventral striatum, and the stronger your reward anticipation related response in that same region. And when we pulled out uh, the, the dopamine release signal and the fMRI reward signal, we found that they were positively correlated, suggesting that perhaps it was this uh, enhanced striatal dopamine release that's driving the increase in reward-related fMRI signal we see in these impulsive antisocial people. So that's all very well and good for community volunteers. Um, it got us a great paper. I was really happy. Um, but then I started not being able to sleep. And uh, I was really bothered because I was making these claims in this paper, but deep down in the darkest part of my greedy little selves, I knew that there was something wrong here. And, and th what's wrong is the following. You've got to question the range of bad behaviors in the kind of people who volunteer for a study. Now, this was Nashville, Tennessee, so you're definitely going to get some lowlifes, for sure. Um, but substance abusers? Uh, criminals? Like, no. The people with significant self-control deficits are the people that we're screening out of this study. And what's more, the task that we use, the monetary incentive delay task, is terrible for looking at decision making, as there's only one choice option. You're not actually being asked to choose between anything. There's no learning requirement, there's no updating requirement, no need for cost-benefit integration. And so I wanted to use a task that was more appropriate for addressing the question I was really interested in, which is why do these people make such terrible choices all the time, in a population that would be guaranteed to have significant clinically relevant deficits in self-control. And so, I made one of a series of terrible life choices and uh, got a one and a half Tesla MR scanner and drove it to two medium security prisons in Wisconsin. And um, I, I, if any of you would like to do this, I would suggest that instead you walk into your IRB office and just ask them to punch you in the face <laughs> because it'll be a much easier experience and much more pleasant for you. Um, but that's what we did. We, we drove this uh, fMRI scanner to a prison in Wisconsin and we scanned incarcerated offenders while they performed an intertemporal choice task. And on this task, on every single trial, our participants had to choose between a sooner but smaller and a larger but later reward. 
And we use these data to test two hypotheses. Uh, one, that's you know, manifestly psychopathic individuals would show heightened value-related striatal activity during choice behavior. And two, that this relatively dysregulated pattern of activity in the ventral striatum was the result of diminished prefrontal top-down modulation of the striatal uh, signal that's representing the value of a particular action. Um, do, do, do. I'm going to skip around a bit. Uh, one note here about this task. Uh, what this task allows us to do, so on every single trial, what happens is the people choose between the sooner but smaller and the larger but later reward. And the delays and the magnitude of the, of the delayed reward changes on each trial. And so we can use a, a mathematical model of choice behavior to estimate for each individual their idiosyncratic discounting of delayed rewards, right? And then we can plug that back in using this well-worked-out hyperbolic model of delayed discounting and estimate on every single trial what the subjective value of each of the two choice options is, right? So the, the, sub, the objective value of this choice is going to be the same for all of us, right? It's $12.50 in two weeks, that's fine. But $12.50 in two weeks means something very different to each and every one of us. And so we use this mathematical uh, model of value to estimate the subjective value of every single choice option on every single trial. And then we plug that back in to our imaging model to get a readout of brain regions that are really important for representing the subjective value. And somewhat unsurprisingly, the brain regions that we get encompass uh, aspects of the, the medial caudate and the ventral striatum. Exactly the same regions that we saw were implicated in impulsive antisocial behavior previously. Uh, as a sort of sanity check, we first confirmed that uh, our trait measures of impulsive behavior showed the, the same heightened striatal uh, uh, reactivity that we'd seen in our previous study. Here we're looking at positive correlations between a uh, paper and pen measure of delayed discounting, the MCQ, and we see that the more impulsive you are on this paper and pen measure, the higher your value-related striatal activity. And we see the same thing uh, roughly for the, uh, another trait measure of impulsivity, the Barrett Impulsiveness Scale. So this suggested to us that we're on the right track. We're seeing the same sort of basic general patterns here of more impulsivity being associated with higher value-related activity in the striatum. Uh, we measured psychopathy using a, a device called the PCLR, the Psychopathy Checklist Revised. The PCLR is the gold standard forensic measure of psychopathy. Uh, it's derived from a, a, of an intensive uh, clinical interview and validation using collateral file material that we get from the Department of Corrections. Uh, PCLR scores range from 0 to 40. Uh, for reference, the population mean of the PCLR is estimated to be about 6. The incarcerated offender mean of the PCLR is about 22. So if we took the, an average of all of your PCLR scores, we'd probably get something like you know, six or maybe higher. I don't know you guys that well. Um, if we go to the prisons and look at the average, it's about 22. You, you don't really consider someone to, to be a full bloom psychopath until they have a PCLR score of somewhere around 30 or above. And we have a lot of these folks. So you can see that we're really sampling the range, the, the distribution that we're interested in here. And we have like a lot of just really bad dudes in this sample, frankly. We just have a lot of people who've done terrible things, which is great for us, because we know that these are the folks who are going to be exhibiting the most significant self-control failures. Right? So we found that the more psychopathic you were, the higher magnitude your uh, stridal uh, value-related signal. So this is very consistent with what we'd seen in our prior work. The more psychopathic you were, the, the higher magnitude uh, subjective value-related activity we observed in the striatum. Um, and I'll just skip around back here. So we next used a, a technique called resting state functional connectivity to identify large-scale networks that could be involved in regulating striatal function. Right? We know from the, the exquisite animal work that's been done that we have these ascending projections from the midbrain and these descending projections from prefrontal cortex. And so 
it would be sort of game over for us if we weren't able to recapitulate what we know from the anatomy using our imaging methods. And we use this technique of functional connectivity to do just that. And the basis of this technique is that spontaneous or intrinsic fluctuations in brain activity measured at rest are correlated between different brain regions. And the pattern of these uh, intrinsic correlations among brain regions allows us to make inferences about the network organization of the brain. The basic strategy is illustrated on the left here. So what we're doing is extracting signal uh, while people are just resting comfortably, eyes open in the scanner. And we can see that the signal just sort of varies kind of, you know, higgledy-piggledy. And we plug that back into our imaging model to find other regions that have a, a strikingly similar pattern of variation across the, the you know, for those 450 seconds. And we see that, as we know, again, from the anatomy, there's significant connectivity between motor cortex in the left hemisphere and motor cortex in the right hemisphere. That's good. On the right here, what we're showing is uh, several canonical resting state networks that have been identified with this approach. All this is showing is that at rest, the brain is self-organized into a series of coherent networks that uh, matches the known anatomy really well and is also associated with cognitive functions that you would predict based on the, the, the nodes that are involved in that particular network. So we use this approach to identify regions of the brain that are functionally connected with that region of the stratum that we found an effect for psychopathy in, right? So what we did was, for each subject, we estimated the strength of the correlation. Uh, or what we did first was we used this seed in the stratum to pull out regions that are significantly functionally connected with the stratum. And what we pulled out was this aspect of medial prefrontal cortex, which is reassuring because we know from the anatomical work that this part of the medial prefrontal cortex has very strong bidirectional connections with the ventral stratum. And so what we did for each subject is examine the strength of the correlation between the stratum and medial prefrontal cortex, right, and uh, psychopathy. So what we found was that people with higher levels of psychopathy, in addition to having heightened ventral striatal uh, 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 subjective value related activity, they also showed weaker connectivity between this aspect of medial prefrontal cortex and the striatum. So the more psychopathic an offender was, uh, the, the, the weaker the connectivity between uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex and stratum. And we also found a similar relationship for the number of crimes that they committed. So the more crimes that a person had committed, the weaker the intrinsic connectivity between medial prefrontal cortex and stratum. And consistent with the idea that prefrontal cortex is important for negatively regulating striatal function, we found that the strength of corticostriatal connectivity was negatively correlated with the magnitude of striatal subjective value reactivity at the time of choice. And that's what we're showing with the scatter plot on the left. So people who had weaker corticolimbic functional connectivity, had higher psychopathy scores, committed more crimes, and showed higher subjective value-related activity in the striatum. So in other words, uh, the, the people with the, the weakest corticostriatal connectivity had the highest value-related responses in the striatum. And finally, we used a, a moderation analysis to test our hypothesis that prefrontal regulation of striatal value signaling is disrupted in psychopathy. And here we show that people with low levels of psychopathy, the people in blue, they show the, the, the sort of typical pattern of uh, negative correlation between corticostriatal connectivity and striatal activation during the intertemporal choice task. So in the people with low levels of psychopathy, this negative regulation seems to be intact. But with higher and higher PCLR scores, with higher and higher levels of psychopathy, you see that this, this relationship is progressively abolished. So we go from a tight inverse correlation between corticostriatal connectivity and striatal value signals in people with low psychopathy to no relationship at all between the two in people with higher levels of psychopathy. So at higher and higher levels of psychopathy, this putative negative regulation of striatal value activation by prefrontal cortex is progressively abolished. And we think that this lack of appropriate cortical regulation accounts for some of the striatal hyperreactivity that we see in these uh, offenders with high levels of psychopathy. 
Before I move on to the next study, questions about that? Not deep questions, though. So that finding suggested to us that uh, there was some disruption in the way that the prefrontal cortex uh, uh, regulates striatal subjective value signals during choice in people who commit high levels of antisocial behavior. And this was really interesting to us in light of some other work from uh, our lab in, in this area. Uh, previously, we had looked at the relationship between impulsive traits and striatal dopamine function. So this is independent of antisocial behavior. So for all these analyses that I'm gonna show you, we actually include as a covariate that factor two score from the psychopathic personality inventory. So you can think of this as something more like sort of pure impulsivity, just the, the inability to regulate your responses, uh, not necessarily uh, with concomitant antisocial behavior. And we found, like we would have predicted, that the more impulsive a person is, the higher their BIS-11 score, the more dopamine they released in the stridum after we gave them amphetamine. So it's a, a nice convergent result. But we also found something else that was really interesting. In these same highly impulsive folks, when we looked at their baseline dopamine receptor levels, not how much dopamine they released after we gave them amphetamine, but the actual density of dopamine receptor expression all across the brain, we found that these same highly impulsive people had lower dopamine receptor levels in one particular region, the dopaminergic midbrain. And these particular dopamine receptors are super cool. There is only one kind of, of more or less dopamine receptor in the midbrain. It's a somatodendritic D2 autoreceptor. So what does that do? Somatodendritic autoreceptors, this is the, the cell bodies in the midbrain, right? Somatodendritic autoreceptors sit on the cell bodies themselves. And whenever you have an impulse from these midbrain dopamine neurons, you get some collateral release locally. And these midbrain uh, somatodendritic autoreceptors sense how much dopamine's released, and then they use that feedback information to modulate dopamine neuron firing. So it's this exquisite homeostatic regulation mechanism that exists locally in the midbrain. And, and we can think of these somatodendritic autoreceptors as very much akin to a thermostat, right? By sensing ambient dopamine levels and then using that feedback information to modulate dopamine neuron firing, these autoreceptors are in a position to regulate how much dopamine is released all throughout the brain. And so we thought that maybe it was a, a lack of appropriate autoreceptor control that was causing heightened striatal dopamine release in our impulsive participants. Kind of like how, you know, in your house, if your thermostat is blocked by a bookcase, your kitchen is gonna overheat, right? Because the thermometer in the thermostat can't accurately sense the ambient temperature, and so the furnace doesn't get the appropriate homeostatic signal to shut it down. And it's a, a very similar, I mean, it's, it's a good analogy if I do say so myself, because in fact, what we saw is that the relationship between having lower levels of these somatodendritic D2 autoreceptors in the midbrain and having higher levels of trait impulsivity is due to the fact that the folks with these lower levels of somatodendritic D2 autoreceptors are releasing the most dopamine in the stridum after we gave them amphetamine. So there is something here to this idea that uh, one path to low self-control might be some dysfunction in the ascending regulation of striatal dopamine drive. So one path to impulsivity is some uh, aberration in the ability of the midbrain to appropriately calibrate how much uh, information it should be sending to the stridum in order to cause the release of dopamine and, and, and as a consequence, bias action selection. But, as we discussed before, these ascending inputs aren't the only means for regulating striatal dopamine responses to reward. We have these descending inputs that arise in prefrontal cortex, and they provide a negative regulation by attenuating the magnitude of phasic dopamine responses. So we have this exquisite functional anatomical arrangement, right? Uh, that allows these higher order value related uh, uh, information that's represented in prefrontal cortex to bias choice behavior by modulating the ability of reward cues to drive action selection via phasic dopamine signaling, no breaks required. And this led us to propose that maybe it's the relative balance of ascending and descending inputs into the stridum that's driving individual differences in the capacity for self-control. 
So the diagram on the left here depicts a, a person for whom the bottom-up inputs from midbrain have a stronger impact on striatal function than the descending projections from prefrontal cortex. The net result being higher magnitude phasic dopamine responses to stimuli with high uh, learned reward value and an action selection that's biased towards the pursuit of such rewards. Irrespective of long-term goals and, and, and representations of cost and predictions about consequence and things like that. By contrast, on the right, this diagram depicts a, a person with stronger prefrontal control of striatal function. And in this person, that same higher order value-related information that's, that's maintained in prefrontal cortex is able to align choice behavior with long-term goals by adaptively reweighting the subjective value of actions that are represented in the striatum. To test this, again, we looked at uh, resting state functional connectivity networks. Um, to, so we, we, choo we chose a slightly different seed. I'm happy in the question period to explain why. Um, but suffice it to say, when we looked at other regions that were strongly intrinsically connected with this part of the stratum, we found, lo and behold, lateral prefrontal cortex and midbrain both were tightly correlated in their activity patterns at rest with the pattern of activity in this part of the stratum. Uh, so we use this, this, uh, this stratal seed to identify these uh, aspects of the, the larger circuit encompassing the prefrontal cortex and the midbrain. Um, so what we did then was construct what we call, uh, and which reviewers hate, a prefrontal bias score. Um, basically all this is is that for each individual subject, we calculated the correlation between uh, the prefrontal cortex in the stratum and between the midbrain in the stratum, standardized it, subtract one from the other. And what this gives us is for every individual an index of the relative strength of prefrontal versus midbrain connectivity with the stratum. And what we found was that, you know, we, uh, we, we then use this prefrontal bias score as a predictor of subjective value-related response during our intertemporal choice task, our, our delayed discounting task. And consistent with our model, we found a negative correlation such that weaker corticostriatal connectivity uh, is associated with higher magnitude subjective value-related activation during choice behavior. So the, the degree to which the midbrain has a stronger effect on stridum, then prefrontal cortex predicts the magnitude of these value-related signals in the stridum during this other task, this intertemporal choice task. Uh, we thought that was such a remarkable result that we didn't believe it. And so we used the open access human connectome project to replicate it. So this is a sample of 124 community volunteers that was collected by the human connectome project. They don't have an intertemporal choice task, so we used a, a gambling task that they had instead. We used the same seed, same uh, prefrontal uh, input bias score derived from our uh, resting state functional connectivity. And lo and behold, we found the exact same thing. The people with relatively stronger prefrontal as compared to midbrain connectivity with stridum, those are the people who had the weakest stridal responses to wins during the gambling task. And conversely, the people who had the strongest midbrain as compared to prefrontal connectivity with stridum, those are the folks who, sh who showed the, the highest magnitude stridal responses to wins during that task. So if, uh, if you've all been paying attention, you would note that I just, I, I, I'm such a good storyteller. I craft such a compelling narrative, but I have made one of the most critical inferential mistakes that you can make in all of science. I've based a causal story on correlational data, and shame on you for not calling me out on that. Very disappointed. But it's true, we're trying to base a, you know, correlational, uh, a causal story on correlational data. It's an input bias model, but, you know, we know that, for one thing, these connections go in both directions, and two, this is a cartoon. The, stride, the, the actual network connectivity of the stratum is, is so much more vastly complicated than, than this reduced little diagram could, could show. So there are many reasons, apart from my, you know, very compelling narrative, why we could see what we're seeing. Um, and so to perform a, a more direct test uh, of causality, we used excitatory uh, uh, 
a transcranial direct current stimulation to actually upregulate prefrontal function during intertemporal choice. The idea here being that by increasing the excitability of prefrontal cortex neurons during choice behavior is going to boost the strength of these descending uh, projections from the prefrontal cortex to the striatum, which we think is going to increase tonic dopamine levels in the striatum and drop the gain on phasic reward signals to reduce impulsive choice behavior. And indeed, what we found is that upregulating lateral prefrontal cortex activity with transcranial direct current stimulation does actually uh, selectively reduce impulsivity. Interestingly, it doesn't change risk-taking behavior at all. So what we did was we had people choose, we had people perform uh, a combined intertemporal and uh, a probabilistic task where on every single trial they were either choosing between a sooner but smaller and a larger but later reward or between a smaller but safe and a larger but risky reward. And what this allows us to do is test some cognitive specificity for our, uh, our brain simulation intervention. And we see that during stimulation, the people who received active stimulation in, where am I? Labels are helpful. Ah, yeah, active stimulation in red, they were significantly less impulsive than the people who received sham stimulation. We saw the same thing uh, at about 30 minutes uh, post-stimulation follow-up. But when we asked them to return two weeks later, we saw no effect, suggesting that these were not due to pre-existing group differences. We don't see, by contrast, any significant effect at all of transcranial direct current stimulation on risk-taking behavior. Uh, we replicated this in a larger behavioral sample and also showed that these effects are not due to changes in the function of an inhibitory braking system. So our, our direct current stimulation manipulation didn't have any effect on inhibitory motor control despite having a very significant effect on decision making. So this, this selectivity isn't something that you would predict if prefrontal cortex were simply acting as a break on bad behavior, right? If that were true, you would also expect to see direct current stimulation make, you know, causing people to be less risk-taking. Um, and, and we think that this reflects that there's something here related to the ability of direct current stimulation to enhance perspective simulations about the value of future states, which feeds back to modulate stridal value signals in the way that I've been talking about all throughout this talk. Um, to test some of the mechanisms of this effect, we then did a study in which participants made the same kind of uh, intertemporal choices in the scanner while they received direct current stimulation. Uh, in the upper right hand, what I'm showing is that in this third sample, we're able to once again replicate our primary behavioral effect. So uh, excitatory direct current stimulation to lateral prefrontal cortex reduces impulsivity. We, I was so excited for a question. OK. Um, uh, we also found that at rest, this manipulation, this direct current stimulation, enhances connectivity between the medial caudate and the lateral prefrontal cortex. And when we look at the, the, the uh, subjective value-related activation in our inner temporal choice task, we found something very cool, actually. What this is showing is that the the value signal for delayed rewards is enhanced when we give the uh, uh, direct current stimulation to prefrontal cortex, right? So in fact, what prefrontal, what prefrontal stimulation is doing is not making it so people you know, downweight the value of the immediate reward, it's, it's in fact enhancing the value of the delayed reward. So this is consistent with this idea that you know, prefrontal cortex isn't some dumb break. It's really important for creating perspective simulations that allow us to estimate the value of actions that maybe we've never even taken before. And that enhancing prefrontal cortex uh, it reduces impulsive behavior by increasing the ability of these perspective simulations to then feed back on regions like the striatum that are involved in action selection and guide our behavior towards more adaptive ends. Um, I do want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to skip this guy. Mm. I'm going to skip that guy too. But I'm not going to skip him totally. I'm just going to give you a very selective, enough so you won't be able to, to see all the flaws in it, but tell you all the ways in which it supports my story. Um, all right, no, I'm just, I'm going to do it. So 
this is a, this is a, all right. So the, you know, the, as I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking like, all right, Josh, that sounds great. You have this hand wavy perspective simulation story that could fit a million other things could fit too. So we really do want to nail down the idea that the, the, the impulsive decisions that we're seeing in aggressive and antisocial folks are really about the, the thing that we think it is, the, the inability of these perspective simulations that are maintained in prefrontal cortex to feed back on the striatum to, to modulate our, our value signaling and behavior. So we chose this counterfactual decision-making task to test this. Basically, on every single trial, what people are doing is choosing between two gambles, right? And we give them some information about the outcome of the gamble that they selected, and then we give them information about the outcome of the gamble they didn't select. And what we can do is, you know, using these you know, mathematical models of affect and decision-making, estimate on every single trial the amount of perspective regret that a person should be experiencing based on the difference between what they could potentially get for one, for the choice of one wheel for the choice of another. Uh, we can also look at the expected value of the two wheels and the difference between those. And briefly, what we find in psychopathic individuals is that their emotional response, this is, this is totally counterintuitive to anyone who studies psychopathy because like the key thing about psychopaths is that they're cold, remorseless, and they don't experience regret. But when you tell them that they won $70 but they could have won $400, they definitely experience regret. They report it, they are, you know, as a, you know, the, the retrospective uh, valuation is totally intact. What's missing is their ability to use those perspective signals about what could happen in the future if they choose this versus this to guide behavior. So this is the most important part of this slide. What it shows is that for low psychopathy individuals, uh, as the possibility of regret increases, the probability of choosing the, the more risky wheel, the bad wheel, uh, for most people decreases but not for psychopathic individuals. They appear almost completely insensitive to this perspective regret information. So retrospective evaluation, retrospective regret, fine. But prospective regret, the ability to use these signals to adaptively guide behavior, totally messed up in these folks. Um, there's also something cool there, uh, a hint that they may be driven, they, they might be sort of rational utility maximizers because they're, they're exclusively going on the basis of the expected value of the two options. Um, this is relevant to the topic at hand because we, our, our measure of behavioral regret sensitivity has this, you know, sort of mind-blowing correlation with incarceration. So the people with the lowest uh, behavioral regret sensitivity, the people with the, the least ability to integrate these perspective regret signals into ongoing behavior, those are the folks that have been incarcerated the most. And furthermore, behavioral regret sensitivity moderates the psychopathy crime link. So psychopaths are known to commit you know, more crime than anybody else, but psychopaths who nevertheless have this intact behavioral regret sensitivity, they show a protective, a buffering effect. So they may have all of the traits, but their ability to use these perspective regret signals causes you know, a change in their behavior such that they, at least in this sample, are not incarcerated nearly as much as the high psychopathy people who don't have that intact behavioral regret sensitivity. Having sufficiently massacred my beautiful data, um, I'll conclude by, by saying that taken together, the, these findings suggest a, a value-based alternative to, to hydraulic psychological models of self-control and self-control failure. Um, you know, patient and, and norm consistent behavior, we think reflects an adaptive modulation of learned action values by these <laughs> model-based perspective computations that incorporate information about rules and costs and goals and consequences. And though speculative, we think that this model-based modulation is affected by those corticostriatal afferents that I showed you before that adjust the gain on phasic uh, reward signals arising in midbrain dopamine neurons. And furthermore, that impulsive and antisocial behavior could occur when some prefrontal dysfunction impairs 
either the development of a robust model of the world, or we think more likely impairs the ability of those prefrontal reputation, uh, prefrontal representations, the, the outcome of those perspective simulations to feed back on brain regions like the striatum that are more directly involved in selecting uh, uh, actions. So with that, I'll conclude, and I, I'm, I'd be thrilled to have questions from you guys. Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure to be here.